Thank you, Terry, um, and thanks for the presentation. Can you um, take that uh, down? Um, we've got a couple of um, uh, people who've indicated that they want to, to speak, and I noticed that they are present in the uh, participants. The first uh, person who asked whether they could they could put a question uh, was um, Andrew Martin. Um, I think Ryan, um, uh, we need to just unmute you, Mr. Martin. I think um, is, is that right, uh, or are you able to? I think your your mic's open. So yes, yeah, um, so I've opened my mic, question, please. Okay, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question is. Why is there so little support for great green belt from the council and councillors when there is so much rhetoric about doubling nature and biodiversity net gain? Let me explain the reason for my question. There are many people concerned about NECAP and the AAP, which is seen by many as a lose lose situation for Cambridge. The first lose starts with a new North Cambridge station. Planners see this as a a way of satisfying the housing requirements and extending business sites, but it has gone to extreme where it resulted in a Hong Kong style ghetto, which is not typical of Cambridge design. There'll be a lack of open space, although you have increased it, it's not to the, it's only a fairly small amount. There are no recreational facilities, no secondary schools and land hungry primary schools will be in cramped conditions. In fact, visitors to the site are being discouraged. There will be an unbalanced demographic due to the high proportion of flat dwellers. There will also be a huge increase in traffic movement as people living there will not necessarily work there and people who work there may not live there. There'll be no large supermarkets in the area, so they will require residents to drive to purchase their weekly shopping. The second lose is a more important one is the relocation of the wastewater plant. The outcome of this is a result of the councils voting for it without due regard for its destination. This is now in the hands of the DCO process, but it will be the result initialized by the two councils who then organized the government HIF grant to pay for the relocation. The shocking decision of Anglian Water, a private company, which is only accountable to itself and the wishes of its shareholders, to choose Honey Hill, a significant green belt site. Anglian Water has totally ignored all of the results of the consultation process. This will result in an industrial size, um, industrial site larger than Wembley Stadium. Yes, larger than Wembley Stadium. Wembley Stadium is 18 hectares. The new Mr. site Mr. Martin, is Mr. 22 Sorry, hectares. Mr. Sorry, Mr. Martin, obviously we've got a number of people who've, who've asked questions in the Q&A and in order to get through, could, can I ask you just, uh, I appreciate the statements that you're making, but but could, could you uh, uh, get, to, get to your question, please? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, I'm basically saying, well, I've already asked, okay. um, I'm basically saying um, there will be a problem and my main problem is about uh, the green belt. So I'm talking about how much interference there will be by uh, uh, destroying the green belt at Honey Hill and the various different um, things that will change the nature of that area. So going back to my uh, question, it is in, in our uh, campaign to save Honey Hill, we have written to many councillors, all councillors, asking for their viewpoints. So I'll ask my question again. Why is there so little, little support for green belt from the council and councillors when there is so much rhetoric about doubling nature and biodiversity net gain. Basically, you seem to ignore Honey Hill. It's green belt. You talk about open space and green, green belt, but you don't even mention it. It's just gone out of the window and not being discussed. So I want to know from councillors and the council what they think about green belt and why they think it's a good idea to destroy Honey Hill. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. I think um, uh, obviously it's a very wide ranging question in terms of um, uh, uh, and, your, and, your, and your comments. I think probably from my perspective, it might just make uh, clearly this is part of a wider spatial strategy. Uh, and I just wonder whether or not someone from the, the planning service can just ex ex very briefly, because I'm conscious of other questions, uh, explain the basis of um, the approach to the spatial strategy that the councils have 
um, put forward at this moment in time as part of the process. Uh, and then uh, and then I'll ask Catherine Martin, I think has also got a question as well, although um, again, please, um, if we can think about keeping it brief. Stephen, would you like me to come in first on, on that one? Yeah, yes, um, please. Yeah. Caroline. Good evening, I'm Caroline Hunt, I'm Strategy and Economy Manager in the Shared Planning Service. So in terms of why the focus on uh, uh, North East Cambridge as a location for development um, in the Greater Cambridge Local Plan, we've looked at um, a whole range of issues as we were preparing the plan in terms of um, the constraints that, that exist in, in and around Cambridge, the, uh, the pressure there is for, uh, for economic development in this area. This, it's been a very positive, a very successful area in terms of economic growth, uh, and that therefore requires um, housing to support those jobs um, and, and where possible those homes to be close to those jobs too. So we, we've looked at a whole range of issues, including the uh, desire to reduce the need to travel uh, uh, and the priority of focusing on brownfield land for development. Um, and uh, the whole suite of evidence that we've looked at, which covers everything from the forecast level of growth through to the importance of biodiversity, which the councils do see as a really important issue. Uh, the transport implications of various different spatial strategies, everything from within the urban area, as, it, as is the case at North East Cambridge, land on the edge of Cambridge in the green belt, which is the case with, uh, you know, we've had a number of sites put forward to us uh, on the edge of Cambridge in, in the green belt, new settlements around, further new settlements around Cambridge or growth, growth around villages. And we looked at over 600 sites in total that were put to us. Um, but what came out really clearly from our residents, particularly from, from a transport and movement point of view, is that North East Cambridge is the most sustainable location for development because it means that people have to travel less. It, you've got already got the, uh, the public transport from Cambridge North Station, from the busway, with more proposals still to come, with the Chitton Trail coming in and so on. So from a from a planning point of view, it is a very sustainable location for development. Now we have been really clear that, and this is a site that's been looked at over, you know, in planning terms in many over many years, um, and it hasn't been possible to look at this site for development in the past because of the constraint of the water treatment works, and um, the plan is therefore predicated on that relocation taking place. It's not requiring that relocation to take place. So yes, we understand that the relocation requires, um, it's like for a, a, a Greenbelt location and the councils will consider those proposals as Anglian Water go through the process as statute consultee in that. Um, but picking up on one of the questions in the in the uh, in the chat, which I think is related to this, is are other sites considered if you, if it if it wasn't North East Cambridge? Well, the answer to that is we considered 600. Um, there are no easy answers to meeting de um, development needs in this area, um, and we would have to look at whether and where the most sustainable alternative location would be which could be on the edge of Cambridge, for example, in other green belt locations or all or, or around villages. Caroline, uh, thank you. For, that's all I was gonna say, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm conscious of, of um, uh, Catherine Martin has also um, uh, asked, uh, asked if she can ask a question. So, so Catherine, uh, over to you, please. Uh, and then I'll turn to the Q and A's. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, James Littlewood has pointed to the lack of open space in the NEC, uh, which will lead to overcrowding at Milton Country Park. Um, you've identified Area 6 as a strategic open space to the northeast of, of NEC. How will this land be paid for and how will this space be used by the public? Do you envisage it as another country park or um, how do you see it developing and what guarantees do you have that this land will be developed as a country park or whatever you see it as. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, uh, who's able to answer the question? 
I can attempt to answer the question. Absolutely. Thank you for um, that's okay. Yeah. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm aware of Cambridge PPF and the comments that they've made about uh, overcrowding at Milton Country Park. Uh, and we're aware of that as well. We know that Milton Country Park is a well used and, and well loved um, site within this area. And lots of people go there from, you know, Water Beach, from Cambridge, and other places as well. Um, in terms of um, what we're what we're looking at in terms of the local plan and these new strategic open spaces um that's something that uh, we obviously published um for the first time uh, only a couple of months ago as part of the the first proposals local plan uh, and what we're doing now is we're actually um working up how those sites could actually come forward because there are a number of large open spaces that we've identified each each one of those will have its own constraints they'll have their own sort of land ownership things that will uh, constraints and stuff that we'll need to take on board but also they will have different kind of functions um you know habitats and things that we'll, that we'll need to we'll need to consider now how we actually deliver those spaces that's something again that we're looking at at the moment we, you know there is definitely scope that they will be funded they could be funded through um, development contributions um, but exactly how in terms of the mechanism is it a section 106 is it a seal levy or something like that that's something again that we're looking at in more detail so I can't give you a really definitive answer at the moment because we're still at such an early stage of the of the local plan process but yes the intention is that these will be areas that can be used by the public um, you know they you know you know, there will be areas where maybe there'll be more habitats, there'll be areas that be more public use. Um, but as I said, you know, that each one will, will be different in its own right. Um, and so it's kind of just on the spot this space in terms of what the, the local plan will say about those as we go out to consult consultation on the next version of the local plan. Thank, thank you, Terry. Uh, and I'm, I'm conscious of trying to make sure that we, we have plenty of, uh, of, of time for the, for the questions. We've got another 15 minutes. Uh, if it's okay, I'll read out some of the questions um, uh, that we've received in the, in the Q&A chat. Um, uh, first, first round of questions, uh, uh, Mr. Martin made, an, made, made a number of points, but um, there are questions here about uh, have the needs of homeowners changed? Um, uh, during the plan period, particular reference to COVID. Uh, and then actually one of the more recent questions that has just popped into the chat, uh, also on the, on the topic of COVID, talks about uh, expectations in terms of people's movement um, uh, uh, and whether these will be commuter homes or whether they'll be gen genuine homes. Uh, Terry, are you able to comment on, on, on that? Yep, so yes, so COVID was, what was really interesting is that we consulted on the draft plan during the kind of, um, I think it was the, between the first and second lockdown. Um, um, so it was really interesting. So, you know, it was really at the forefront of people's minds. One of the things that people were really keen on was just the availability of open space in the local area. Sorry, hello, uh, sorry, my son. Uh, so the availability of open space on their doorstep, which was really important. So they didn't have to travel miles in their car or whatever to actually just find some green space. And again, it was about the informal space. It was where they could walk their dog. It's where they could just go for an informal, you know, walk with their family, as opposed to somewhere where they will go and have a game of football or, you know, a game of cricket. So that was something that we really took on board as we started to develop the plan further. Um, the question about homes, obviously, you know, as a planning authority, we have no necessarily control over, you know, who buys homes um, exactly. But what we are doing is making sure that we develop our plans to make sure it meets local housing needs. So we're doing um, studies on that as part of the local plan, and that's feeding into this. And the the sort of the types of homes, for example, like the the, the some of the smaller units, we know that working with colleagues in housing that there's an acute shortage of smaller units uh, um, that sort of uh, help the council's housing register. So that's again, something that we're, we're working up with, with our housing colleagues to make sure that we're providing the right housing in a really sustainable location on the edge of Cambridge, close to facilities and, and jobs. Thank, thank you, Terry. There are a couple of questions relating to Milton Country Park. One is around the delivery of the, um, I think, re referencing the Sporting Lakes proposals. Uh, and the second is um, uh, the uh, issue about how Milton Country Park is, is supported in many respects by uh, people driving to it and paying the parking charges. Uh, do you want to kind of place, uh, because we, had, we have had representations about Milton Country Park. Um, Caroline or Terry, I don't know whether you just want to comment about uh, the potential 
uh, in future for Milton Country Park to be uh, to receive su support from development at, at, at NEC. Yeah, so we've, we've actually been engaging with Milton Country Park for a number of years now. Before this forum was set up, we actually had a community liaison forum and Milton Country Park were actually on, on that forum and we, you know, we've developed a really good relationship with them as, as part of that. Now, at the moment, the, the planning permission for the Sports Lake proposal has lapsed, so there's no, there's no definitive proposal uh, on the table at the moment for the Sports Lake uh, extension. So in terms of how, uh, in terms of the plan making process, we can't specifically say where the, uh, any offsite contributions from Northeast Cambridge would go if there isn't a firm proposal in place. So we can't say X amount of money or is gonna go towards Milton Country Park because at the moment there is no proposal. So that's something that we'll need to keep, uh, uh, keep in mind as we undertake the health check on the air action plan, but also as the plan continues to go through the examination process. And then later on, uh, through any plan reviews as well. So that's something that we're, we're really mindful of. Um, uh, the infrastructure delivery plan that we've done undertaken for North East Cambridge identifies that, um, that, that developer contributions towards strategic open space off site, so places such as Milton Country Park or the area uh, that I showed in my presentation between uh, Cambridge and North Stowe and Water Beach, is for over a million pounds to go towards off-site green open spaces. Now that's in addition to the 69 million pounds that we anticipate will be for on-site green and blue infrastructure. Um, so a considerable amount of money going towards green and blue infrastructure and as I said, over, over a million, at least a million, um, if not more, towards um, off-site enhancements. Thank you, Terry. Um, there's a, there was a question about accommodations for uh, cycling, uh, particularly uh, in terms of um, uh, routes across uh, and, uh, and over the river. Can you, can you just comment on, on uh, the extent to which, I'm just looking for the comment in the chat, sorry. Uh, yeah, what new cycle connections are you considering to cross the river? Uh, so uh, as part of the spatial framework, we aren't, we aren't proposing any additional um, connections over the river. Uh, obviously the Chisholm Troll Bridge has just, has just uh, recently gone in and opened, which is great. So what we've been really keen to do is make sure that we have a really good network within Northeast Cambridge for walking and cycling. And we provide all the necessarily seg segregated routes and things uh, to make sure um, that walking and cycling is the kind of the obvious choice for people when they're moving in and around Northeast Cambridge. Now, um, one of the things that we are keen to do is have a bridge over the railway line that goes into the area known as Cheston Fen, which is just the, the, the top end of, of um, Fen Road. And then that will then provide a link to the to the um, to the river towpath, uh, which that will then enable people to go north up towards Water Beach and then south towards the Chisholm Trail and and the city. So we're not providing any new bridges in in addition to what there are, but we are improving connectivity towards the river in that direction. Thank you, Terry. Um, uh, we've had a a question about um, when we can when can we have a date on on when we predict whether we will need a secondary school or not, uh, or is that or is that uh, uh, an expectation that residents will move when they they have children that, that that are older? Do you do you just want to clarify um, the position in terms of uh, the education uh, engagement? Yeah. So. We We've we've been working really closely with colleagues at the county council, both in terms of the demographics team that, that generate the population forecast and also the education team there as well. North East Cambridge would only actually generate around 1.4 uh, forms per entry um, in terms of secondary school provision. And I think I believe the minimum is kind of around four or, or five forms of entry in order to in order to actually require a new school. Um, so, so based on that, the, 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 the numbers aren't there in terms of um, secondary school pupil yields. And so therefore, um, the county have recommended that we go with um, off-site contributions to improve the existing schools within the existing communities. Thanks, Terry. Um, uh, there's a question um, uh, about uh, the mix of housing proposed for uh, NEC. How many one bedroom and two bedroom flats and houses and so on? I don't know whether you can provide a breakdown on that. I don't have the percentages with me, but we can provide that afterwards um, in the written responses. But it is, um, it's fair to say that it's predominantly flatted. Uh, and I believe that the majority, that the 
the largest proportion of those are, are two bedroom units. Uh, but uh, we can give a detailed breakdown. But it's, the, the numbers are actually in the area action plan itself. But I can, we can provide that. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to man <laughs> I'm trying to look at different screens. But um, I've got a raised hand from uh, someone who identifies themselves as as Anthony. Um, uh, Anthony, are you able to ask your question? Yes, it's Anthony Carpenter here. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can, Anthony. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my question is about the Milton Road garage site, which is just south of um, the busway and just west of Milton Road, and it's just within the southern boundary of the site. And you've got about 75 homes, I think, um, uh, uh, initially allocated for there. But the area footprint is about this uh, is actually larger than that for Parkside Pool. And I've had a number of conversations with councillors saying that this would be an ideal spot for either an indoor swimming pool or a Lido because it would serve two of your most economic economically deprived wards in Cambridge, i.e. East Chesterton and King's Hedges, and it would serve the North Cambridge Academy and it would serve Cambridge Regional College as well as um, the um, Northeast Cambridge site. Furthermore, you've got all of the public transport and the active transport access, North Cambridge Railway Station, all of the villages along the busway, and furthermore, your indoor sports facilities strategy from 2015, I, yes, I'm that sad, I read these documents, said that um, Parkside Pool, the main used pool at the moment, is already over, well over capacity um, at the moment, in particular in peak times. And also Cambridge University also recently announced that they are not prioritising their West Cambridge swimming pool. So therefore, I urge you again, if Anglian Water go at, decide to go ahead with ministerial approval for their move to wherever they're going to move to, um, to look at that Milton Road garage site as one where you can build a swimming pool. Thank, uh, and, and finally, in the consultations that you do, please ask the children, please ask the primary school, secondary schools and CRC whether they think it would be a suitable site for a swimming pool because ultimately they will be the ones, it's their future, they're the ones who are going to be doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, Terry, you want to comment. We have, uh, I think you, you, you touched upon the issue about um, pool, pool provision. I, I suspect there is something, Anthony, to come back to in terms of thinking around um, pool provision across the, 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 the growth plan in the local plan as well. But it's, a, it's an, you know, I think the point's well made uh, and, and certainly we can t take that consideration uh, away. Uh, I'm conscious that I've got about six more minutes uh, to try and cover some questions. One of the, one of the threads that uh, a, a couple of people have highlighted it, it is around, uh, I think Caroline, you covered this question about why um, uh, the loss of the, of the green belt is being um, uh, uh, tolerated. I, I, I'm just looking for the precise wording, but why, why the loss of the green belt is being um, uh, envisaged for the relocation process. Uh, uh, in the um, uh, by uh, the assumptions made around uh, northeast Cambridge, I don't know whether there's anything that you can add to clarify. I think it probably needs a, a longer answer in in response. But is there anything you can say now? And I'll just tee up another question. I think it, it, there, there would be lots to say, and I'm just trying to think how to how to address that in a in a succinct way. Um, I guess the the opportunity that is provided by this area in Northeast Cambridge is, is one that is not replicated anywhere else in or around Cambridge because of the existing and proposed public transport opportunities, the proximity to the science park and so on. It really does provide an opportunity to provide homes close to jobs, help reduce travel and, and get people out of their, out of their cars. Um, Caroline, can you just, um, I'm conscious of time and sorry to interrupt, but I'm conscious there's also a question though about how the carbon footprint is calculated to draw that conclusion that you've just, that you've just outlined. Can you, can you just comment on that? So the, um, as we look at the local plan, we look at the sites that are within our plan, but we also look in combination with other projects. So as the local plan and the area action plan progress, we will look at 
um, the carbon impacts from arising from both the development proposals, but also other proposals such as water treatment works. I do just wanna mention though, that the de development control order process itself um, will need to look at um, the carbon impacts, not only of the new proposed uh, 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 works, but also the, uh, the, 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 in, the use of and demolition of the, the, current, uh, the current site. And that is something that the planning inspector have made clear in their screening opinion that they expect to be covered through the development control order process. So that, that, will, be, that will be picked up. Thank you, so Caroline. Do you want me to respond to the one where someone's come back on something I said earlier about whether we looked at downsizing on site, or would you rather? Uh, I think it's probably. I'm, I'm keen to to try and in the in the three minutes that we've got left, a number of people have asked about infrastructure and um, both the phasing uh, and update of existing infrastructure, and also the imposition on on communities, not just in the city, but also in in Milton particularly. Uh, I don't know whether someone can comment about. Um, uh, I, th I think there was a concern that investment or, or, or contributions would only be uh, dispersed towards Cambridge uh, when there were there were some concerns about um, uh, Milton uh, and uh, and also um, the phasing of that infrastructure. I don't know, Terry, whether you can answer or Caroline around the infrastructure program uh, or information that, that underpins the AAP. Well, it's very much looking at North East Cambridge as, as, as an entity across both district areas. And as we move forward to the local plan too, we're looking at Greater Cambridge as, as one planning unit through, through the plan. So Section 106 agreement would, uh, and contributions would absolutely look at the most appropriate places for provision to be made. And it wouldn't be limited by the administrative boundary between Cambridge and, and, and South Cams. Uh, in terms of the phasing and provision of infrastructure, clearly that's a really important issue um, and that's something that the infrastructure delivery plan does seek to look at and, and as the proposals will come more forward in more detail would absolutely need to be looked at and we are mindful that that is a particular issue in an area where there's a number of different land ownerships and developments will come forward at different times so that's one of the reasons and significance of the AAP and trying to look at this in a very much a holistic way to make sure it comes forward in a, uh, in, a, in, a in a way that brings um, all the infrastructure that's needed for the site but also will bring benefits we hope to surrounding communities. Thank you Caroline. Um, uh, I mean unfortunately uh, I don't think we're going to uh, some really really good questions uh, in the in the um, Q&A uh, section uh, which I don't think we're going to be able to do justice to by um, trying to squeeze any more in. There's a question about the availability of uh, the slides. Uh, they will be along with the recording um, uh, available I'm sure for uh, for people to peruse. Uh, there will be um, uh, there will be uh, uh, answers to all of the questions that haven't been able to be uh, answered live, as I said at the start on the uh, on the um, uh, web page for the um, forum uh, in in due course. We'll aim to do that. Uh, I think um, I think we aim to do that uh, as soon as we possibly can, uh, but to make sure that we've got comprehensive answers for those people that have that have raised them. Uh, Terry, thank you for your. Um, presentation. I think it's 6.45 and I'm doing my very best to, to keep people on time. Um, uh, we have uh, 